But uh, let me say this on, on the text of what uh, the subject that I feel in my heart today. A faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Now, Peter compared the Christian's trials to the testing of gold in a furnace in 1 Peter 1 and 7. And the patriarch Job used the same image. And in, in Job 23 and 10, it says, But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, he said, I shall come forth as gold. See, God's purpose in allowing trials is not only to verify our faith, but it's also there to purify it and to remove the dross. Um, God knows what kind of faith we have, yes, but oftentimes we don't know what kind of faith we have until we go through the fire, until we're right in the middle of it, if you will, we, to figure out what kind of faith that we have. And the only way to advance in the school of faith is to take examinations. That's, that's the only way I found out. You see, we got to take a test every now and then. God will give us a test. He'll put it, put it on our plate, put, let it come to pass in our way. Sister Rose knows what we're talking about. But God will give us a test every now and then to try our faith. And for what is a test without a testimony? It's through the flood. It's through our flood that we find our faith. Through difficulty that we can find that inner desire inside of us to live for the Lord. And through suffering, sometimes where we can find our true salvation, even. So with that being said, I'm going to talk here on the subject today of famines, flocks, and fights. Famines, flocks, and fights. And we're going to turn to the book of Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 through 13. And you can remain seated for this because I do have, sorry sister, uh, we, we do have uh, several uh, scriptures to read here today and I don't want to belabor everybody by just reading here but the book of Genesis chapter 12 verses 10 uh, 13 through 18 it says this oh hallelujah it says verse 10 says and there was a famine in the land everybody said there was a famine and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me. But they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, that she was very fair. And the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken in the Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And the Bible says, and he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. Somebody said that he had flocks. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with the great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou, she's my sister, so I might have taken her to meet a wife? Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her and, and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. And Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. The Bible says in verse 2, And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. Unto the place of the altar, where he had to make there at first. 
And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. And verse 7 says, And there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. Somebody said they had fights. <laughs> and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. So Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plains of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward, for all the land which thou seest. To thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent, and he came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Amen. How many of y'all know that we need an altar? If you'll allow me for a brief, just a few brief moments here today, and I'll try to make this as quick. I know we got our kids here. But uh, let me talk on the subject of famines, flocks, and fights. Famines and flocks. And fight, fight, and fights. Lord, we love you today. And I pray, God, your spirit would speak unto us, Lord. Help us to understand, open our eyes, receive, God, your word. God, give us revelation, give us inspiration. God, let your spirit, God, move in this place to draw us so closer to you, God. I pray in the name of Jesus today. Help me, Lord, to preach your word. Touch my spirit, God, touch my body. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus to preach what thus saith the Lord. I pray, God, today in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. amen. Famines, flocks, and fights. Now, in the onset of this message this morning, let me start by saying that God does allow trials in our lives. Notice the story of Job, God's child. God allowed him to be tried. We all know that the devil was the one doing the trying, but the Lord allowed it to happen. God will allow the trial, but not to your destruction. Oh, hallelujah. You see, in the passage of our text this morning, there is, this is where Abram was. He was in the middle of a famine, but he was not destroyed. But it wasn't only himself that was suffering this famine. It was also his family. That was suffering in the famine. It was also his servants that were suffering in the famine. It was also his flocks that were there suffering as well in the famine. And if I can inject this quick thought right here this morning. When the man of God goes through a trial, we all go through a trial. You may not even realize it. You may not even know it. But when the man of God or the pastor suffers, the church suffers. But listen to this little lesson. From the beginning to the ending of the scriptures that I read here this morning, the family all the way through the famine stayed with him. Oh, hallelujah. That's good news to me. Praise God. The servants stayed with him. The flocks stayed with him. They were going to the promised land. and They all had a destination to where they needed to go, you see. So they all stayed together with Abraham or Abram, and they all stayed together with the man of God. You, somebody knows where I'm going here with this here today. You need to stay with the man of God. 
You need to find yourself a man of God in your life. Stay alongside of the man of God. Even when it seems like there's a famine going on in your life. Even when it seems like uh, uh, times can be dry in your life. Stay with the man of God. Because at the end of the famine, there is a blessing. At the end of the drought, there is a refreshing. At the end of the journey, yes, there is a, a promised land. But you've got to be able to stand with the man. And let me just go a little bit further. Whenever you're in the middle of that famine, when you're in the middle of that drought, go ahead and lift up the man of God. For he is gonna he's gonna give an account for your soul. So you might as well, you might as well get on his good side. Lift him up. Pray for him. Don't worry about the famine. Just stand with the man and watch God's plan begin to expand in the middle of your life. Hallelujah. And, and Abraham and his family and flocks, they, they were in the middle of a famine. And we come to the age-long question, why the trials? Why the famine? Why does an all-powerful God Allow experiences that seem cruel and laden with pain. Questions of this character have puzzled man from the beginning of time. So let us note some suggestions why from other experiences this morning. We know that the diamond and charcoal are made from the same elements. But when charcoal is acted upon by an intense heat, we know that a lustrous diamond is the result. But it cannot become the diamond without the heat, without the fire. We know that steel is the rough ore that's transformed by heat. It cannot become all of what it's intended to be without the heat, without the fire. When the tender body of the oyster is wounded, it dresses the wound with a pearl. Layer on layer of mother of pearl is formed around the foreign substance that's abrasive to it, whose intrusion has caused the irritation in the midst of that oyster. But the beauty is formed from the irritation, you see. The beauty is formed from the abrasion. The beauty is formed from the uncomfort in its life. Storms themselves have value, you see. They they keep the sea and air from stagnation. Without the storms and the trials in our lives, we can very easily become stagnant and lethargic in our Christian walk. <coughs> you see, as they say, the, the darker the night, the brighter the stars are silhouetted against this dark background. And the darker your trial, the darker your situation, the darker your night seems to be. It's going to allow you to shine the brightest that you have ever been. Because the light of God that's in you is most seen through the cover of your trials. See, God's ways are past finding out. They're past understanding, says the scripture. Sometimes we just do not understand why God operates and, or does the things that he seems to do in our lives. Oftentimes we become disillusioned and even disappointed with God. But God always knows what's best. God always knows what he's doing. And he knows what's best for us. So sometimes God will let a little stinging blow to fall upon you in your life. And the blood spurts. And the nerves wince. The soul begins to cry out in agony. The blow seems to you to be an appalling mistake. God would never do this, but, but it is not, for you are the most priceless jewel in the world unto the Lord. And he is the most skilled lapidary in the universe. Let us beware of the questioning, the methods, and the approaches of Almighty God. For we, even here today, we lie in his hands. And he knows just how to deal with us. He knows how to shape us. He knows how to, how to make us. He knows how to liken us unto his own image. And sometimes that just cannot be done without, without the tears. 
without the breaking process in our own lives. You know, I'd like to challenge your thinking this morning on the thought of trials and hardships in your life. I believe that God has bestowed upon his children a sacred stewardship of suffering. There is a stewardship of suffering. We are, you see, we are trustees of trials. In other words, God trusts us with trials. Anybody catch that? Is everybody, everybody alive here this morning? God, God trusts us with the trials that he places in your life. And so that we may demonstrate the reality of faith and show forth our unshaken loyalty towards God for those around us. Job said it something like this. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Saint of God, brother or sister, right here today is your chance to provide through your trial just such a testimony to some wandering and wavering heart. That even though I'm in the middle of it, even though he slay me, I'm going to trust him. Even though I'm in the middle of the fire, I'm still going to serve him. I'm still going to walk for God in the midst of my storm. Amen. For his mercy endureth to all generations. But perhaps a more helpful approach to this problem is in a look at the abiding values that come through our trials. A trial, you see, a trial leads to the discovery of the glorious presence of God in our lives. This is illustrated in the story of the fiery furnace. You all know the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That, that fiery furnace, it was, it was heated seven times hotter than it ever was before. And while the three loyal worshipers of the one true God, they were thrust right into the middle of those flames. And on making the inspection that the amazed king, he said, were there not three cast into the furnace? And behold, I see a fourth whose face is like the son of man, or son of God, excuse me. You see, it's in the presence of this fourth person that's always provides our hope. It's much like Moses, if you will, at the burning bush. There was a presence in the fire that made a difference in the experience. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say here today that God is in the fire. God didn't make himself known until the Hebrew children got in the middle of the fire. They had to get in the middle of the test. They had to get middle in the middle of the, the situation in their lives in order for God to, to express or to show himself unto them. Moses didn't hear from God until he changed his direction in life and started to move closer to the fire, to move closer to that that burning bush and today we need to draw a little bit closer to the fire we need the fire we need the fire of the Holy Ghost in our lives and can I also say that we also need the trials and if you're in a valley if you're facing a tough situation you need to find the fourth man in the middle of your fire because it's in the heat of the moment where you're going to find the presence of God. Another discovery suffering brings to us is the depth and adequacy of God's amazing grace. Isn't it so odd that we learn by contrasts so many times in our lives? In other words, we appreciate the sweet because we've tasted the bitter. We... Learn to appreciate the light because of the darkness. We appreciate the joy in our lives because of some of the sorrows we've weathered through. You see, grace appears in its wondrous sufficiency when administered as a healing balm to the wounds of suffering in our lives. If the Apostle Paul were here today, I would ask him, what did you learn from the thorn? I believe he would turn around and tell me, I learned the adequacy of grace. Amen. When I prayed three times for that thorn's removal, God answered. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. You see, he needed the thorn to learn of grace. You know, when golf balls were first manufactured, they, were, they made the covers smooth. Um, 
But then it was discovered that after a ball had been roughed up a little bit, one could get more distance out of it. And so they started manufacturing golf balls with dimpled covers. And so it is with life. It takes some rough spots in our lives to make you go a little bit farther, a little more effective, a little more useful to the Lord. I think this is how God dealt with Abraham. You see, we see that Abraham was called out of Ur, the Chaldees. He was called by a God that he didn't know, but upon whose word he obeyed. Abraham took a great step of faith. And after he arrived, he, he saw God a second time and heard his word of promise. Abraham and Sarah probably expected to settle down somewhere and enjoy their new home and all the promises of God, but God wouldn't let them. They couldn't get comfortable. They couldn't, they couldn't enjoy uh, uh, the, the comforts of life. They had to continually move forward to the calling where God was pressing in their spirit. There is no record that Abraham ever faced a famine in Ur, or no record that Abraham ever faced a famine in Haran. But now that he was in God's land, now that he was uh, uh, moving forward for the promise of God, he, we find in Scripture that he, he had to find food for a large company of people. He was in the middle of a famine, plus food for his flocks and food for all of his herds. So after obeying God, after finally saying yes to the Lord and, and pushing back the comforts of life, why did God then allow the famine to happen? I believe that it was to teach Abraham and Sarah a basic lesson in the school of faith. A lesson that you and I have got to learn as well. And that's tests often follow triumphs. I, I, you might have thought I said that backwards, but I said it right. Tests often follow triumphs. And this principle is illustrated in the history of Israel. No sooner had the nation been delivered from Egypt... Then they find the Egyptian army, chased them down, and cornered them at the Red Sea. God brought them through, of course, but then they faced another test. There's no water in, in, in verse, chapter 15, verse 22. After that came hunger in Exodus 16. And then after that, an attack from the Amalekites in, in Exodus 17. Tests followed their triumphs. Every time God delivered, God showed themselves strong. Then there was another test. Here it comes again. You know, a new convert once asked, he said, I thought that getting saved was the end of all of my troubles. <laughs> but now I know that faith in Christ has given me a whole new set of problems. <laughs> but he went on to say this. He said, but now there are two differences between my past life and my new life with God. He said with a smile, number one, now I don't have to face my problems alone. Oh, hallelujah. Because I know that God is with me. And number two, I know that God allows them for my good and for his glory. Praise God. After you've won a great victory of faith, expect either the enemy to attack you or the Lord to test you. Or both. But this is the only way you can grow in faith. It's the only way you can grow in faith. God uses the tough circumstances of life to build the muscles of your faith and to keep you from trusting something other than God's word. Don't try to run away from the problem, but always try to learn to run to God in the midst of the problem. Instead of remaining in the land and trusting the Lord to help him, Abraham, the Bible says, went down to Egypt in Genesis 12 and 10. You see, in the Bible, Egypt is a symbol of the world or of the world system and its bondage. While the land of Israel is a picture of the inheritance of the blessings that God has for you. Notice that when the people went to Jerusalem in Scripture, the Bible always says that they went up. But when they went to Egypt, the Scripture always says they went down. The same is true, spiritually speaking, folks. 
Going down to Egypt means doubting God's promises. It means running to the world, going back to that, that old lifestyle that you had, uh, going down, amen, away from God uh, and, and doubting all the promises that God has for you. And when circumstances become difficult and you are in the, the furnace of testing, remain where God has put you until he begins to tell you to move. For faith moves in the direction of peace that moves in the direction of hope but unbelief moves to the direction of restlessness and fear and towards the world in times of testing the important question is not how can I get out of this but the important question is what can I get out of this know that God is at work to build your faith what's really happening behind the scenes What's happening in the things of the spirit whenever you're going through a test or trial? God is working in your life to teach you a lesson, to build your faith, to draw you closer to him. God alone is in control of your circumstances. As much as we would like to say, I'm in control of my circumstances. Oh, my God. I know there's probably some witnesses here today that, that knows that you're not really in control of the circumstances as you think you may be but it is God in God alone that's in control of your circumstances you are safer in a famine in his will than in the palace of kings outside of his will it has well been said the will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you Abraham, he failed the test of circumstances or he failed the test of the famine and he turned from the will of God and he went down to Egypt. And once he, once he was in Egypt, Abraham faced a whole new set of problems. And that's always what happens whenever you turn your back and go back to the world. Or if you run away from one test, you're going to get yourself right in the middle of another one. Leaving God is not your answer, folks. Somebody give me an amen to that. Leaving God is not your answer. Running to the world is not your answer in the middle of a fire. Once you enroll in the school of faith, you're not allowed to just drop out. Just because of one, one failed test or, or one failed uh, uh, circumstance. But God has a purpose in your life to fulfill in you, to fulfill through you. And he will do all that is necessary to make you succeed. Man, you see, in Canaan, all Abraham had to deal with was a famine. But in Egypt, he had to get along with a proud ruler and all of his officers. Pharaoh was looked on as a god, but he was not a god like Abraham's god, who was loving and generous and faithful. Abraham soon discovered that he had been better off dealing with the circumstances in Canaan than with the people in Egypt. Notice the changes that took place in Abraham's life because he went down to Egypt. To begin with, Abraham moved from trusting to scheming. Abraham had no altar in Egypt. And you don't find him calling on the Lord for guidance and help when he went down to Egypt. Do you know what faith is? Faith is living without scheming. Trusting in God with not trying to figure out how to do things on your own. Hey, somebody. Hey, man. Somebody knows what I'm talking about here today. When you stop trusting God's word, you start leaning on man's wisdom. And, and leaning on man's wisdom always leads to trouble. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 20. Abraham and Sarah brought this half-truth with them from Ur. And when you find yourself scheming in order to escape problems with people, beware, worse trouble is coming, coming down the road in your life. Please notice that when Abram went to Egypt, he also moved from confidence to fear. When you're in the place of God's choosing, you don't ever need to be afraid. You don't ever need to fear. For faith and fear cannot dwell in the same heart. The fear of God is the fear that conquers every fear. Hallelujah. But the fear of man brings a snare, according to Proverbs 29 and 25. 
So God in his promise to Abraham had repeatedly said, I will to him. But now since Abraham was in Egypt, Abraham was saying, they will. Genesis 12 and 12 says, Therefore it came to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. What happened? What was the difference? What am I talking about here today? Abraham took his eyes off the Lord and started looking at the people. He started looking at the God and said, God will. God's going to move God. He started looking at say, these people will. He started looking upon the world to try, to try to control the people instead of trusting in the hand of God. Finally, when Abraham went to Egypt, a third change took place. He moved from others to self. He lied so that it might be well with me for Sarah's sake. And as I was reading those scriptures, I, I was thinking, you know, as a husband, Abraham should have thought first of his wife and not of his own well-being. And the more I thought about it, he probably shouldn't have ever taken his wife there in the first place. How many know that a husband out of the will of God can bring an untold trouble to the wife and to the whole family? And now, let me flip that around as well. I know I didn't get very many amens from the guys there. Uh, how many know that a wife out of the will of God can bring a whole lot of trouble to the family? No, that's right. But please note here today, since Abraham went to Egypt, instead of being trusting, instead of being confident, instead of thinking about others, he moved to being a schemer and fearful and thinking about himself. And that's what the world will do to you. That's what the world does. It changes you from trusting God, from being confident in God, and of thinking of others to, to a mode of, of scheming and fearing and, and being selfish and trying to save yourself. And this all leads to the fourth change. Abraham moved from, being, from bringing blessings with him to bringing judgment to those around him. You see, God called Abraham to be a blessing to the nations. That was his calling. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. But because of Abraham's disobedience, judgment fell on Pharaoh and his household. If you want to be a blessing to others... Just stay in the will of God. Uh, at Jonah, we know that Jonah ran from God's will. And what happened? Uh, it caused a storm that almost sank the ship and all the sailors that were in it. God's judgment passed from Jonah onto those that were around him. Like, like Jonah, Abraham lost his testimony before unbelievers. And he had to face his sin. But here's the good news. Out of all of this today. Out of the famine, with the many flocks and those around him, God still graciously watched over Abraham and brought him out of a very difficult situation. Hallelujah. The Bible says that Abraham, he learned his lesson. Yes, he did. And so what did he do when he learned a lesson? The Bible says that he repented. And he went up. Out of Egypt. Oh, hallelujah. Once you repent, once you talk to God and say, God, I'm so sorry. God, I, I'm sorry for, for staying out of your wheel. I'm sorry for trying to run from you. I'm sorry, God, for, for going out into the world. Uh, once you repent, you've got you to find yourself and get out of Egypt. you got to get out of your world. you got to get out of that old lifestyle. you got to get out of what you once were and, and to start walking towards the will of God in your life. When you disobey the will of God, the only right thing to do is to go back to the place where you left him and to make a new beginning in your life. No failure is permanent in the school of faith. Abraham went back to his tent, and he went and he found that old altar again and the life of being a pilgrim and a stranger. You know, a casual observer of this episode might conclude, they said, well, well, what happened to Abraham really wasn't all that bad. I mean, uh, I mean, Pharaoh gave Abraham a whole lot of wealth. Genesis chapter 12 and 16. And, and Sarah was given her own maid, Hagar. That's where she came out of it all. 
And God forgave Abraham's sin, and, and he, he did start over again, and he had a whole lot more with him when he got out of it all. So what's the big problem? The big problem is that everything Abraham received in Egypt later caused him trouble. Because of their great wealth, Abraham and Lot could not live together. And they had to separate. There was strife between them. There was fighting amongst God's people. Hagar, the Egyptian maidservant, she brought division and sorrow into the home in Genesis 16. Having had a taste of Egypt or having had a taste of the world, Lot started measuring everything by what he saw there in Egypt. And this led to his downfall and the ruin of his whole family. You see, there are no benefits from disobedience to God. And so what is the lesson to be learned from all of this? The practical lesson is from all of this is to simply never abandon your altar. Never abandon your relationship with God. Stay in fellowship with God. No matter what the circumstances are like. No matter what may be going on around you in your life. And can I dare say it? It's the fiery trials where you need to be the closest to the Lord that you have ever been in your life. It should prompt you to draw closer. It should, it should spur us to pray. It should, should ignite something inside of us that desires to be all that much more closer to God in the midst of our circumstances, in the midst of the storms, in the midst of the things that, that go on in our lives. If you have disobeyed God and God is maybe disciplining you, Go back to the place where you left him and make things right in your altar. Remember this. The victorious Christian life is always a series of new beginnings. Amen. Now, that's not an excuse for sin. Don't misunderstand me. But it's an encouragement for daily repentance. To find God every day for a new beginning. Do you know today's a new beginning in your life? Hallowed, to live for him afresh all over again, to push all the past behind you and to live for Jesus. The Bible says that Abraham, he lived by faith and not by sight. No matter what Lot did, Abraham was not worried about his future, for he knew that everything was in the hands of God. Abraham, had he never read Psalms 47 and 4, or he never read Matthew 6 and 33, but he was putting both into practice by his faith. He had met God at an old-fashioned altar, and he knew that everything was going to be under God's control. When God is first in your life, it makes no difference who is second or who is last or who goes where or what anybody else does or what they do not do. But all that matters is that my feet today is planted on the rock. I mean, all that matters today is that my faith is on a firm foundation. All that matters today is that I know that my life is not my own, but I am bought with the price with the Lord Jesus Christ. Lot had a tent but he had no altar, which meant he did not call on the Lord for wisdom or in making decisions. Instead of lifting up his eyes to heaven, Lot lifted up his eyes to the plain of Jordan and stopped there. The eyes, you see, they see what the heart loves. Abraham had taken Lot out of Egypt, but he could not get Egypt out of Lot. Let's all stand here today. Amen. You see, Lot, Lot had a great opportunity to become a man of God because he walked with Abraham. But we don't read of Lot's building an altar, or we don't read about Lot calling upon the name of the Lord. We read that first Lot looked towards Sodom in Genesis 13 and 10, and then he moved towards Sodom. In Genesis 13 and 11. And then finally he moved into Sodom. Yes. In Genesis 14 and 12. You see instead of being a pilgrim who made progress. Lot regressed into the world. And away from the blessings yes. of God. Scripture says in Genesis 13 and 11. That he journeyed east. And turned his back on Bethel. Yes. Bethel means the house of God. 
He turned his back on the house of God and towards Ai. Ai means ruins. But Abraham let God choose for him. You see, after Lot had gone away, Abraham had another meeting with the Lord in Genesis 13 and 14. Lot had lifted up his eyes and seen what the world had offered. But now God invited Abraham to lift up his eyes and see what heaven had to offer. Yes. Lot chose a piece of land which he finally lost, but God gave Abraham the whole land which still belongs to him and his descendants. Lot, had, Lot said this, I'm going to take. But God said to Abraham, I'm going to give. Yes. What a difference yes. that is. Yes. Are you willing to give today? Say, God, you do with me whatever you want. You give me whatever you desire. Yeah. Or are you going to pick and choose like Lot picked and chose? There's such a difference, such a contrast. You see, Lot, Lot lost a lot. <laughs> Lot lost his family. But Abraham was promised a family so large it could never be counted. Lot was living for the possible, but Abraham was trusting God for the impossible. Through the famine, with his flock, through Egypt, through the fighting, the discipline that Abraham had experienced in going down to Egypt had taught him to respect boundaries. So now God could trust him with horizons. Now it is your faith in God that determines how much of his blessings you're going to enjoy. You see, Satan wants to use your trials. He wants to use your circumstances. He wants to use people and things to tempt you and to bring you out, to try to bring the worst out in you. But God also wants to use those same circumstances, those same tests, those same trials to bring out the best in you. Abraham failed the first two tests because he rested his faith in man's wisdom instead of faith in God's word. But he passed that third test with great distinction because he finally said, okay, God, it's in your hands. God, it's in your control. I'm going to find that altar again. I'm going to find that place of dedication and consecration again. And I'm going to let, let it all go and allow you, God, to take control in my life. The main difference was that Abraham never forgot the importance of having an altar you may be here and no, no matter what's going on in your life we've got to learn to keep that altar in our lives amen so we're coming at the perfect time in this message today we're going to come to this altar and talk to the Lord you may I don't know where you're at in life you may be in the middle of a famine you may be fighting your flock, <laughs> Fight, fighting your family, worrying about your flock, worrying about the dry season, worrying about the tests, worrying about the trials, worrying about the, the valley that you're in, the storms of life. Can I just say this? In the middle of it all, you've got to find an altar. In the middle of the fighting, find your altar. In the middle of the famine, find your altar. In the middle of trying to worry how to take care of everything and, and that, that you have to do in life, try to find it. Find your altar and let God, let God begin to take control of it all. Let God begin to minister to you and talk to you and help you and, and to bring something special out of you, to purify you, to purge you, to, to bring you to the place where He wants to, to use you in your life. Hallelujah. The tests and trials are not meant to destroy you meant to bring you to a new place a new place in him a new place of dedication a new place of revelation in him and let me just add it's, it's not enough to repent but you also got to learn how to leave Egypt you got to learn how to leave this world behind you and start living a life that's holy, pleasing to God. Sometimes that means leaving doubt behind us, leaving worry behind us, 
Can I say it this? This isn't to offend anybody here, I promise. It's not pointed at anybody. We got to leave scheming behind us. We got to leave trying to control things behind us. We got to, our, our, our tendencies to pick and choose, we got to leave all that behind us. We got to love everybody. Amen. We got to, we got to show forth Christ to everybody. We got to, when we read the word, we got to receive it all into our lives. There's no picking and choosing anymore. I mean, the word of God is not a smorgasbord. It's not a buffet where you can pick and choose what you want. We got to take it all in. Amen. And say, God, I'm going to give it all to you. No longer, no longer just thinking about myself. No longer me not trusting or not uh, or being fearful. But God, I'm going to find you and I'm going to leave it all behind. And I'm going to walk towards you because because I'm going to a pr I'm going to a place. I'm looking for a pl promised land. I'm looking for your blessings, God, in my life. And God has promised to be with you every step of the way. Amen. Why don't we lift up our hands and our hearts? Let's talk to Him today. God, we love you. Oh, hallelujah. We give you praise and glory. God, we love you, Jesus. I pray, God, through the fire. God, through the storms of my life, Lord God, I, I want to, God, I pray, search my heart and try my thoughts and know my ways, God. Help me, Lord, to have a pure Jesus, heart. Help me have a clean spirit, God, in my life. God, and to leave everything behind me. God, and help me to press, God, towards that mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Lord, I love you, Lord, and I praise you.